Amen. Thanks for being with us today. Um, my name's Josh, and I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Fellowship Church, and it's a privilege to be with you guys today. We are in a book called Habakkuk, and people have been telling me all week that I say Habakkuk and Habakkuk, and I, you never quite know what I'm going to say, and I'm sorry. Um, we got one more week of that. Um, so anyway, we're, so we're in Habakkuk, and we've done two weeks of it already, and, and today we're in week three, and we're in chapter three, and <clears throat> this little book has been pretty interesting to walk through, and so if this is your first week with us, I'm going to very briefly just try to like catch you up so you get a tiny bit of context. Here's what it is. This prophet named Habakkuk, he is probably a paid worship leader in God's temple um, back at about 600 BC. And Habakkuk has this conversation with God. And in the midst of this conversation with God, he says things and then God talks back. And then he says more things and then God talks back. And he preserves this whole conversation because the whole thing kind of teaches us a little bit how to pray. And how to walk with God ourselves. And so we're thankful we've got this little three-chapter book. So here's the way the conversation is gone. Habakkuk starts with God and says, hey, my nation, which is called Judah, he says, my na nation has gone to this really rebellious, wicked, evil place where a lot of people are getting oppressed. There's not justice. There's too much violence. All this bad stuff is happening. God, I need you to deal with it. And he doesn't really specify how God should deal with it. But we think he probably had in mind, like, maybe give us a new king and a new government. Maybe send some kind of nationwide revival. That would certainly help. God responds and God says, none of those. Actually, I'm going to bring a foreign army to invade Judah. And I've seen the corruption that's there. And I'm going to judge it using this other nation. As you can imagine, that is not the news Habakkuk wanted to hear. Because it's his nation, it's his country. You wouldn't want to be told that you're about to be thrust into a war and oh, by the way, you're going to lose. That's what God just told him. So he responds back and ultimately what he says, Habakkuk says in his response is, God will evil, will the bad guys ultimately win? Like this judgment might need to come, but are they going to win in the end? And God's response then comes in chapter 2, and God says, hey, here's how it kind of goes. Almost every nation that's out there, they're evil and they're wicked on some level. And then another evil, evil nation was going to come along and gobble them up. And then an even bigger fish later on is going to come and gobble that one up. And this is the way it goes with these evil, wicked systems in this world. And it finally ends in a place that we call Babylon. And Babylon is described there in chapter 2. Babylon also shows up in Revelation 18. You don't have to remember any of that. But Babylon symbolizes like this evil system and the way it works. And this might sound familiar to you, but the entire government, the entire social structure is based on this idea that when it comes to sexual pleasure, when it comes to greed and money, and when it comes to power and our need for it, no matter how much you give to us as human beings, we always want more. We always want more. And we always want more so much that we will oppress other people, even make them slaves. Other people will be hurt so that we can have just a little bit more. And that passage talks about the fact that God will judge that evil system eventually. And he says, but before I do, my people, you need to come out of that system. You might be in this world physically, but spiritually you need to get out. And what does that mean? It means, it means you've got to get away from a system that needs that next sexual pleasure, that needs that next dollar earned, that needs that next vote cast for you. You need to get away from all of that because that's the way the world works and it's killing us. So God says, you got to come out. Okay, so that's where we left last week. So today, chapter three, Habakkuk just got this bad news. God just gave him God's explanation on this whole thing, not really what he wanted to hear. And then Habakkuk is going to surrender. Say surrender. He's going to surrender to what God has said, and here's how it looks. Um, verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. This prayer was sung by the prophet 
Habakkuk. I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. So it says this is a prayer that he sung. So he sings it. He writes it into a song. And we're going to come back to that a little bit later. But somewhere, it seems, in the midst of praying this response back to God, this worship leader looks at it and says, wait a second, I think people are supposed to sing this. Which, I, I love that. And, and we're, like I said, we're going to get back to it. I don't want to ruin that part. But he says, God, in your anger, remember mercy. Okay, Here's what he's doing. He's surrendering. He's agreeing with God that they deserve judgment. But please remember mercy. So when you were a kid, did you ever get caught doing something wrong? Never. And if you were smart, you might have gone to mom and dad. And instead of lying about it or whatever, instead you went to them and you're like, I did it, but please be merciful. It's a great combo, isn't it? And I would say, by the way, that needs to be part of our prayer life. There are some things that come into your world and you know that God has brought those things there and that therefore you're good, but you can still ask for his mercy and his kindness even in the things that you deserve. It's just, in your anger, remember mercy, God. I know we deserve this. The bold, it's the bold child of God that prays confession and asks for forgiveness of sins and then asks God to limit the consequence. That's the bold, bold child of God. That's good. Okay, so, so after those first two verses, then Habakkuk keeps praying. And, and what he does in the midst of his prayer is he starts remembering the greatest hits from Israel's past. And he starts talking about the Red Sea and the way that God judged Egypt. And he starts talking about the, the sun standing still with Joshua. And he talks about all these different scenes. And what he's doing is he's building his faith and he's remembering just how big God is and how good God is, even in his anger, how good God is. And then he gets to this line in verse 16 and says, I tremble inside, trembled inside when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear. My leg, legs gave way beneath me and I shook in terror. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people that invade us. So he's surrendering and he's contemplating, thinking about the judgment that is to come. And he begins to physically tremble. Some of you have gotten a call in the middle of the night that something happened and you physically trembled when you got the news. Some of you were in a hospital waiting room and news was giving to, given to you and you physically reacted. And that's where he is. He says, I'm sitting here and contemplating what's about to come. It hasn't hit yet. But this is so devastating, what we're about to experience, that he's trembling. And it says from his, was it from his, his lips quivering to the legs that gave way beneath him, he seemed from my head all the way down to my feet. It's a full body quiver. And then he says, I will... I will wait on God. His, his waiting, his statement there that he's going to wait quietly, it reminds me of Job. And some of you guys remember this, this book, this book of Job. It's a hard book, by the way. The book of Job seeks to answer the question in all of its chapters of why do bad things happen sometimes to good people? There's some people that struggle to believe in God at all because that question for them, they don't feel that they've received an adequate answer to how, how come bad things, how, how come tragedies happen to good people. And the book of Job goes through that because Job goes through everything terrible that anybody could ever go through. And then he finally asks God the big question, why, partway through. And when God responds, God refuses to answer his question. He doesn't answer why. He doesn't explain himself. What he says to Job is he gives Job himself as the answer. He tells Job who he is. And he explains how he keeps this world, this universe spinning, how, how he created it, how, how he's full of love and strength. He gives Job himself as an answer is, you have me. You don't have the reason why, but you have me. And it's a twist ending. It's not what you expect. 
And Job responds with these words, Job 40, verse 4. He says, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you, God? I lay my hand on my mouth. Just see him there. God, you said you're the answer. And I'm going to go quiet. And I'm going to receive that and surrender to that. Habakkuk is doing the same thing. He says, I will wait. Then in verse 17, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. How many times does he say even though? Three times, even though, even though, even though. Even though I did not get the answer I wanted, even though it's going to be bad, even though this is one of those dark seasons in my Christian walk that I'd rather just skip to the end of. Anybody ever have one of those? Even though, even though. And what's he, what's he describing here? Even though the fig trees have no blossoms, I had to look that up and learn about figs this week. One of the wonderful things of my preaching life. Why does it say fig trees have no blossoms? Because the blossom is what becomes the fig. The blossom, if you, if you actually tear open a fig, you'll see the remnants of the flower it started as. So, so the blossom, what, what it means is you've got no figs on the tree and you have no promise of figs coming. So it's bad today. And there's no hope on the horizon, at least not for figs. And there's no grapes on the vines. There's no olive crops and the fields are empty and barren. So not only is there no harvest this year, but no more seeds are being planted for next year either, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. Like we don't have the flocks anymore. We don't, we don't have the cattle. We don't have the sheep. We, we, don't, we don't have anything to milk. We don't have anything to get meat from. And definitely no wool for our clothing and our blankets, right? Like everything is, everything is bad, and nothing's in the cattle barns either. And what's that reference to? Well, when you get the mama cattles and the daddy cattles together in the barn, maybe baby cattles come. There's nothing coming. It's bad today, and it looks rough on the horizon, even though, even though, even though. Remember the even though, because it matters. Verse 18, yet I will. Even though, yet I will. This, even though, yet I will, that's faith. Even though my circumstances are terrible, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. For the choir director, this prayer is to be accompanied by stringed instruments. So let me walk you through these verses, and I'm going to do it relatively quickly, and then I'm going to come back to a few of them and slow down. The very first thing is, yet I will, even though everything is bad, yet I will. He said, I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. My salvation. Don't miss that little word. This, this whole thing, this song, it's all about little words that he puts in there because they're all super important. He doesn't say the God of salvation theologically for all humanity for all time. He says, no, my salvation. He's the God of my salvation. What is he saying? He's saying, I, Habakkuk, the prophet, am being saved right now. What do you mean you're being saved? He just told you everything's going to go bad. Nah, but I'm being saved. I'm being saved because I have God. I'm joyful in the God of my salvation. See, I, I, I'm going to run to the anchor. I'm going to run to the rock. I'm going to run to the safe place, and, and I'm going to run. And that's what he's doing at the end of this chapter is he's, he's running to God. See, Habakkuk stands in for us in this sense. Do you know how many people come back to church and come back to Jesus because they want something? They want a blessing in their life. They want a freedom in their life from a thing. They want a breakthrough. They, they want this for their kids. They, they, they have things that they want, and, and that's okay. It's okay to come to God with things that you want. But what happens when he says no? 
do you not want God anymore? Because Habakkuk comes in chapter 1 and he wants a thing from God. And he gets told no. And here he is at the very end of the book. And if you'll receive it, he's showing us the pathway to a deep faith. He says, even though, yet I will. Even though I got nothing that I asked for. Even though I got nothing that that I thought I wanted. Yet I get the one thing that I do desperately want above everything else. See, my joy is in God. My joy is in him because I have him and nobody can take him away from me. And he doesn't stop with joy. He says, the sovereign Lord is also my strength. Again, it's personal. That's Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, L-O-R-D there. That's what your translators did. They took the divine name Yahweh and they put Lord in for it. But he's getting very specific. He's not just talking about God. He's talking about Yahweh, the God of the Israelites. He's my strength, the one true God. And again, it's personal. He's sitting there trembling physically from head to toe. And he says, the Lord is my strength. See, this man knows some things about faith that we need to understand. Because even when your nation is destroyed, the Lord is still the Lord. And even when everything falls apart, God is still God. Jesus still loves you. You still have him. He's the only thing that can't be taken away. You know what separates all of us from losing everything we hold dear? Minutes. Minutes. We could all get a call tonight. Like, well, that's a depressing message. I know. But isn't it true? Because when you got that call before, you never expected to get that call that day. But it still came. And the only thing that you have to hold on to, the only thing that makes you strong is the Lord in moments like that. And then he says, you make me sure-footed. Now, this is a weird one. He says, you make me sure-footed. You make me like a deer up on the mountains, right? on the heights. I'm able to tread upon the heights, except he says my heights. And the, the, the scholars don't give you the word my there because they think it's weird, but it's, it's what's there. He says, I get to tread upon my heights. Okay. So I couldn't figure this out. So I actually drove up to the top of Mount Scott Friday. And I didn't hike to the top of Mount Scott. I don't want to over impress you. I drove there like the tourists do. (laughs) And I'm up there and I'm hopping on boulders in my vans, okay? And I I I, and I and I'm hopping around and 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 I get far enough out to where the view is pretty gorgeous, but you can see like some of these gaps between the boulders. And if I go the wrong way, I'm gonna slip and at least break a leg and I have to scream and hope somebody comes and saves me. And I realized in that moment that the vans are not very sure-footed. I should have had some different shoes on. And I don't understand the deer and how they have the hoofs and they're sure-footed with that, but whatever. But they do. God made them for it. And not only did he make them for it, but they succeed at it. When they succeed at it, it's, it's somehow it's their mountain. So... I, Again, I was still wrestling with this. And, and my mind went back to when I was in high school, um, our youth group took us snow skiing. Uh, we'd go to Wisconsin, and there was a place there. And, and I remember all through junior high and high school, it's like, Illinois kid, I'm learning how to snow ski very, very slowly across those years. And yes, there were injuries, and it's probably a bad idea for any youth groups, Pastor Ricky. Uh, don't do it. But it was fun. I enjoyed it. But here's the thing. By the time I got to my my very last year doing that, I remember that they would categorize these different hills, and some of them were called black diamonds. Some of you know that. Black diamond, is that's the most extreme, most difficult thing. And there were two black diamonds. I was able to go down and still be alive at the end of the hill. I'm not saying it was pretty, but you get down to the end of it, and and I got to tell you, this high school kid was like, that's my hill. That's my hill. I conquered that. Right? I was a conqueror on that. I made it. Habakkuk sitting here saying, God gave me sure feet so I could stand on my mountains. Because what mountain is he on? 
His nation's about to crumble. He never expected to get this kind of news. This is, this is the hardest news he's probably ever gotten in his life. And he's like, God, somewhere in those three chapters showed me the way to stand strong on this mountain. And because I'm standing on it, that makes it my mountain. I love the triumph that is in his voice there. And then he gets to the end of it and says, now this goes to the choir master because the choir needs to learn how to sing this particular song. And again, like, how, how far through this did he get? Did, the, did he get to the, you know, even though, yet I will? And he's like, boy, that sounds like a, sounds like a good rhythm. Like, what? let's, he makes it into a song. But I think it's deeper than that. I think he knows the corner spiritually that he's turning. He's like, God's people need this. God's people need this prayer to sing themselves. So he crafts it into a song and says, teach it to the choir master. And it's going to get played with my stringed instruments. Just briefly, there are people right here in this church that write music. Did you know that? And I've watched that process take place. And I just got to tell you, it's beautiful. Because what they do is they mine out of the, the deep places of their souls, the experiences they have with God, and at some moment, they have some moment where they say, that wasn't just for me, that's supposed to be for others. And what they do is they craft these beautiful prayers and they set it to music and they give it to you so that you can sing and make it your prayer. I just think there's a ministry in the church we don't talk about very often, and I think that's beautiful. Habakkuk is saying, the journey I'm going through is all of our journey because we've all been there, even though yet I will even though yet I will. This is a mature faith. We talk a lot in this church about salvation. We talk a lot about Jesus on the cross and the fact that you are forgiven for your sins and you can have a whole new life if you want it, if you reach out and surrender to him, that you don't have to earn anything. You don't have to become ultra religious to make God happy with you, that Jesus did that for you. We talk about all of those things pretty commonly. But this idea of like, but how do you survive moments like this? How do, you, how do you get to this deep valley and find that you've got the faith to survive it? Habakkuk's coming in in this tiny little weird chapter that most of us have never read before. And he's telling us the secret. He's saying, I put my joy in the Lord and I put my strength in the Lord. So let's start with joy. What's joy? Joy is my pleasure. Joy is my happiness. Joy is what makes me happy. Joy, joy is, are, are the experiences. Joy are the things that I like. Joy, every, all that. Joy. And he's saying, there's little joys. Like you got a thousand little joys, but what's my ultimate joy? And how does that work? I'll give you an illustration. See, I love Dairy Queen Snicker Blizzards. They are the best blizzards. They're absolutely fantastic. There was actually a couple years where they took those blizzards away. I don't know if they had an argument with Snickers, but it was awful. It was awful in my life. <laughs> but they're the best. I'm on an eating plan currently that does not include Dairy Queen Snicker blizzards. <laughs> so when I want that, I say no to a small joy. Because my greater ultimate joy is in pants that fit in a healthy life. Amen. And so I am willing to sacrifice and say no to some small joys so that I can have an ultimate joy. Does that start to make sense? Yeah. It's the same thing with savings. Like, like you go to Walmart and that thing that you really like is on the best sale it's ever been. And you want that small, that small joy. But you have a greater joy, which is we're going to save money so that our kids can go to college. And that's, a, that's an ultimate joy for us. It's a greater joy. So I'll say no to the small joy. So I say yes to this joy. And sometimes we get our joys mixed up. Yes? It's all of us. But here's the thing. Whichever joy wins at Walmart or Dairy Queen, that's your ultimate joy. What are the joys that are winning? Because when you make the decision that I will say no to this so I can say yes to this, you're deciding what wins and you're shifting your heart. 
you shift your heart just a little tiny bit at a time every single time you make one of those decisions. And every single time that God comes in and says, I'm removing this particular joy from your life, sometimes we ask why and sometimes we throw fits and sometimes we get angry. Sometimes he's doing that on purpose to to pull our heart away from a lesser joy toward him. I'm not saying that God has bad things for us. But sometimes we are too attached. And sometimes that attachment is actually bringing some bad stuff into our life. Some of us, our, our, our joy, the problem with it is it's going to fail someday. Your, your joy is in your business. Your joy is in, in this um, romantic partner. Your joy is in, in, in uh, uh, your, your savings account. Your joy is in all of these things. And then when all of a sudden those things go away and something happens, does your life fall apart? Because all your joys will fail you. Whew. Like, like some of it, some of you guys, it's, it's your kids. They are your ultimate joy. They've become your ultimate joy. What happens when they move away? And they never call you? What happens then? What happens to your heart? Are you going to live in abject misery for the rest of your life? Or does God want to adjust your joy? Because they are a joy. But should they be your ultimate joy? See, God might have something to say about that. Even the book of James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Because when you face those trials, God is coming in to change your character. And even the process is him shaping you and refining you and setting you free from some things that bind you. Some of your joys are changing you into a darker version of yourself than you actually want to be. Remember Babylon? With its pleasures and with its greed and with its power, some of our joys are wrapped up in those things. And we are spiritually in Babylon and God wants to set you free because your, your pleasures are killing you, yes? Your pleasures are killing you. It's the little si- decisions that you make every single day. Your greed is making you a cruel person. And your need for power tends to isolate you. There's all kinds of things that go wrong there. God is my joy. Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I just like that little verse there because David turns this whole pursuit of your ultimate joy and says it's a decision. You have to, it's an action. You have to choose to delight in God. Every single time God says no and takes something that you wanted away is an opportunity for you to say, yes, God, but you're my ultimate joy and you will never leave me and I can count on you. How about ultimate strength? <clears throat> Habakkuk also says that God is his strength, meaning his ultimate strength. What's your strength? Strength is what you're confident in. Strength's your foundation. Even if I'm weak everywhere else, I'm at least strong here. So right, for Superman, it's the fact that he's bulletproof, right? Right, for Iron Man, it's the fact that he's got brains and he's got technology. For Spider-Man, it's his spidey sense and his reflexes, right? Like if all of you guys have got that, I've got this and I know how to play to my core strength. Now I know that's just silly, but aren't we the same? Because some of you, when the chips are down, you go right to your education and your degree is what's going to save the day. Or your business or your retirement account is what's going to save the day. You see your core strength as right there. What happens when the small strengths start to fail you? Your real foundation is got to be in God alone. He's the only thing that won't fail. And all these trials that come along and all these little daily decisions that come along where I say, I will not have my foundation here. I will not see my security there. It's only here. Oh, that's hard. What's your go-to? What do you rely on? Habakkuk says that Yahweh is his strength, his confidence, his salvation. We have soldiers here. And your strength is in your physical body. And it's a lot of times what you're valued for. What happens when your physical body fails? 
See, the Lord wants your strength to be centered in a better spot. Strength. So yesterday, I met a woman yesterday, and her, her strength was in the right place, and she absolutely blew me away. Habakkuk is leading us to a mature faith. Habakkuk is leading us to a strong faith on a strong foundation that can, can survive. So I met this lady yesterday. We were, we were at a gravesite, and we were spreading ashes. And this family had come together. It was this beautiful little service. This family had come together, and there was so much love, and um, it was really hot. The sun was really hot, but there was so much love. And as they were spreading the ashes, it was my job to explain a little bit how the Bible tells us to say goodbye to someone. And so I took him to Jesus on the cross, and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And so he, he trusts the Father and says, I give myself to you. Even Jesus himself, when he's about to cross the line of death, he says, Father, I'm going to trust that you're going to catch me on the other side. So I'm committing myself to you. Isn't that beautiful? And so we stood there as a family together and said, we're going to commit this lady that has been wonderful and that we love. And we're going to commit her to the Father. So we did that together, and it was a precious moment. And, and um, so this lady walks up to me afterward, and I'd met her once before, but, but she's, she's 90 years old. And I can say that because she told me, okay? I'm not guessing there. And she's so classy and put together and articulate and making eye contact. And when she talks about her faith, she's just absolutely on another level. And so she looks at me with this big smile on her face and she's like, she's like that faith you were talking about and trusting God that way. She's like, I know what that's like. She's like, that's my life. Big old smile on her face. And then she starts to share details. She starts to say, yeah, she's like, I, I had a, a baby that I lost that was stillborn and my husband died back in 2011. Different things are difficult to get through, but God's been there for me. And then she throws out this additional detail. She says, and I had an 18-year-old son, and I got the call that he had died in a car wreck. And I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there with a giant of the faith. So I have to ask, how did you get through it? She gets this big smile on her face. She said, when I got the call and our family was walking through this, you know, impossible situation. And she said something happened in the midst of it all where it's like all the, all the grief inside of me and all the tears just kind of choked up inside me and nothing would come out. And I was just paralyzed. And she said, I just started reaching out to God and I just started begging him. Lord, you have to help me through this. And so... She had gone home one of those nights and she said, suddenly in the midst of prayer, all of a sudden her tears started to come. And she said, and once I started crying, she said, I, she said, I, I bawled all night long. She said, you think I'm joking? She's like, I bawled all night long. And she's saying this to me with a big smile on her face. She's like, that's how I know. <laughs> That's how I know God's with me. 70% of this room, you're like, that's not the ending to the story I expected at all. How in the world did she make it through that? What about her why? What about, what? how could God, she didn't get the answers she wanted. But you know what she got? She got God himself walking alongside her saying, I'm going to lead you by the hand through this thing. And she went to him because he was her strength. And he gave her the one thing that she desperately needed. And she's sitting there with a smile on her face in a graveyard, probably 40, 50 years later, telling me, I got my miracle. God. Those are the deep waters. We got some saints around here who know what it is for real to walk with God. Amen? Amen. You guys stand. I 
I look at that 90-year-old spiritual giant and I say, she knows what it's like to tread on the mountaintops because she conquered that thing. The Lord helped her. Love that. So let's pray. Jesus, Lord, I know we've reached into hard places today, God, and sensitive places, places where there's real pain and real questions, God. And God, this all stirs things up in us, Lord. And um, Jesus, I pray that my words would just fall away right now, God, and that people would, they'd start connecting with you, Father, right now. And I pray, Lord, that you would show them how to make you their ultimate joy, how to make you their ultimate strength. Father, show them. In Christ's name, amen.